and action! Hello and welcome to episode 350 of the Filmmakers Podcast. <laughs> this is a podcast where we talk... Filmmaking. From indie film to studio films, uh, to TV, to documentary and... Everything in between. How to get them made, how to make them and how to try not to... F it up in our very humble opinion. Yay! This is episode... <laughs> 350, ladies and gentlemen. Amazing. Yes. Well done. Amazing. Deserves that whoop. In five years, this is what we've achieved. Just talking to each Mm. other over Zooms. Have you you added (laughs) up how many hours you've actually spent talking to each other and what you've gained? No, but do you know what? I could do the the math if you wanted. You could do the math (laughs) for us. It's not going to be a happy stat. If there's a mental (laughs) breakdown sort of stat... (laughs) Yes, then we have achieved that. That goes up as we talk to each other more. (laughs) So thank you so much for bearing with us and listening thus far to how many episodes you have listened to. So many back catalogues, so many episodes. But today we are back with part four of our Business of Film Explained. Because the Business of Film is the series on the Filmmakers Podcast where we go into stats, facts, percentages and figures of filmmaking. And we have the best in the industry joining us on this. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce the other two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, save me two. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. <laughs> oh, this guy. Oh, this guy. <laughs> we have Phil Hawkins. He's a writer and producer, uh, but he's mainly a director. He's directed The Butterfly Tattoo, Being Sold, uh, The Last Showing, Four Warriors, and his brilliant fan film Star Wars Origins, which has just gone over two million views on YouTube. Um, it's an epic masterpiece, in my humble opinion. His latest feature, The Universal and Sky movies prancer a christmas tale uh, probably will be available again next christmas he is currently deep in prep on his next feature it's phil hawkins everyone hello yay yeah thank you no delay insert the clap here please <laughs> yeah, is that t- what you call it a tumbleweed <laughs> <laughs> lovely to be uh, here to be the butt of everyone's jokes and the butt of everyone's facts as ever. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. We've also uh, got the wonderful Dom Lemoyne, who's a director, writer, producer. He's directed three films, including Winter Ridge, starring Ted Lasso's Hannah Waddingham. He's also produced soundtrack to 16, When the Screaming Starts, I Love My Mum, and the upcoming The Unreason. Dom Lemoyne. Hello. Woo, yeah. Woo. How are you? <laughs> I'm pretty good, yeah. Pretty, pretty good. good? Yeah. yeah. Well, second podcast of the day, but... Obviously, I'm extremely excited about this one in particular. Se- second only in order, right? Not in... Like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. The head- head- headliner. Filling order. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The headline. That's what it is. Silver medal. <laughs> Silver medal. <laughs> it's the end of the night. It's the ten past two. Is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, You'll yeah, do. Yeah. Well, to be fair, it's, it's two hours, two, two or three hours before Giles usually sort of ropes me on for some kind of late night. Oh. Intro. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you went there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Giles, I am Giles. Uh, I am Giles Alderson. In fact, I'm a director. director, writer, and producer of such studio films such as Millennium's The Dare. Drink. Um, uh, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, World of Darkness. Uh, I'm drinking. Of... Producer of three. Producer of Three Day Millionaire, yeah. uh, yep. which is now on Netflix. Um, director of Wolves of War and Stranger in Our Bed. Yay! That there is we me. Go. There we go. Hello. And our special guest, as always, for these Business of Film episodes is the amazing Stephen Follows. Uh, he's a very established data researcher in the film industry. His work has been featured in the New York Times and many more. He runs the fabulous website, stephenfollows.com. Link to that is in the show notes. Go to it. Uh, you can find pages and pages of filmmaking facts and figures. He's taught at major film school. His script writing has won Virgin Media Shorts, the Reed Film Competition, and many other awards. He's also been nominated for a Biffa, and he's longlisted for a BAFTA. Um, he's produced over 100 short films, two features, and he hosts the podcast Show Me The Money and authored by AI. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Follow! No, I'm cheering for myself, which feels terrible. But uh, <laughs> yeah. welcome to the film industry. Does it though? <laughs> Does it really feel terrible? <laughs> I was clapping then, but obviously Zoom cuts it out, so you can't. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. sure. All sure. of us were. Uh, that's cut, cut it out for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> Silent clap. Silent clap. 
Um, on the first uh, episode of the business of film, we did talk about if there's a typical route to becoming a film director. Why is the gender equality in directors and getting your film on Netflix and its benefit for filmmakers? On the second business of film episode, we chatted about is failure. Is it a failure or not? If you don't make a second film, why you should be a verb, not a noun, and why it's harder to get a second screenwriter credit within five years. On the third episode, which I forgot to write, so, oh shit, I've got to well, try and remember. There's a few verb, verbs to describe that. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, one minute. All about the strike, <laughs> wasn't it? I think one. I think he's being a noun. Ah, let's be thank honest. Thank you. But, no. Thank you, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the third uh, <laughs> Business of Film episode was all about the writer's strike. Uh, link to all those will be in the show notes. So go to them, listen to those after you've listened to this. <laughs> so today, gentlemen, we should talk about the SAG strike. We should talk about actors uh, becoming directors, actors in this business. How does that sound? Great. Great. Yeah? Yes. Great. None of us are members, right? Can we do this? Are we allowed? <laughs> Can we talk about That's it? That's a good point. Well, actually, you are allowed to do podcasts. I was looking up. Um, yes. Actors, yes. One directors. Of the, one of the allowed. exemptions. Yeah. Although. Uh, Can yeah, you promote a movie? Podcasts that operate under, podcasts that operate under SAG-AFRA contracts are also still free to continue as a micro-budget independent films and student films. I just kept reading the sentence after it, after it finished the red of a bit. <laughs> I believe you're not allowed to promote the movie, but I think people have said the movie they're on or the host has for them i think that's how it's working at the moment but technically you shouldn't be there to promote the mm. movies no actors yes, definitely that's correct yeah uh, right it's very difficult i mean if you've just done a movie and you can't promote it obviously yeah tough position it to be hasn't in really hurt barbie or oppenheimer has it um, yeah, I mean, they had, well, they haven't really because they they were all being promoted and had their sort of all the interviews done yes. early on. So yeah. it's the next wave, really, yeah. because I think the Oppenheimer, yeah. they moved the premiere forward by an hour so that the stars could be out before the strike started. Well, the UK one before the strike uh, started. But that so mm. Oppenheimer had its premiere at the moment the strike kicked off, which means that it's the next round mm. of movies. Once they've let the I don't know what that's coming out in a couple of weeks, it's but like, it's like Oppenheimer dropped the bomb on it almost. <laughs> That was actually a good one. I, I know you have to give that you have to give him one. kudos for that. That was actually that was really yeah. good. <laughs> I wonder if Barbie has the legs to keep going. Uh, Wait, no. oh, stop <laughs> it! Stop it! And Ken. Uh, and Ken and Ken can't miss out. Ken, I've not seen either yet. I can't wait. I'm very excited. But um, yeah, I've seen Oppenheimer. It's uh, it's outrageously good. Mm. <laughs> on, on, on that bombshell um, well, one, one, of bombshell. The, one, one of the people that have been, has been asking for a waiver to promote his movie is Tom Cruise so he has actually been asking for a waiver which uh, when I first wow. heard that I was thinking it was like oh it's just Tom Cruise wanting exceptionalism all that stuff but when you look into it the, the man's really done a lot of work to try and get the two sides together in the last few months he's been meeting wow. with both of them what's the waiver for? well he wants to is it, is it for he wants to keep promoting the movie basically and I, I don't know it must be the world tour it must be like there'll be later mm-hmm. releases exactly mm. and, and wanted to talk yeah. about it and as i said when i first heard it i was just i just thought oh he just wants something different but actually no it sounds like he's really tried to bring the two sides together not successfully yet but he has sort of said mm. like he's quite keen to support sag's idea of actors being able to keep control of their rights not have their image sold off for a single fee or ai generating mm-hmm. it or whatever but yeah it's, it's a tricky one isn't it because he's sort of he's been part on the pedestal of like the you know savior of cinema post covid with top gun and you know these mm. big releases getting people back into cinemas which is amazing but like you know and tom obviously is listening so i'm i'm, I'm very very uh <laughs> i'm very hesitant what i say no but no it's like you you think Obviously, with all the work behind the scenes to get them talking, but you'd like, if you make an exception for one of the biggest movie stars in the world, what does that say when it trickles down? Mm. You know, it's kind yeah. of, you kind of got to choose a side a little bit. Tom. Well, 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 he's been trying. <laughs> his point, I think, is look, look to the studios. He's saying, look, there are some things that actors are asking for that are around dignity that, like, are no brainers. Let's try and agree them. Yeah, yeah. And then also on the other side, he's saying to the actors, look, cinema is just about kicking off again we really yeah. need mm. this to survive let's not let's not mm. undermine that this is what the reporting is obviously there's probably going on a lot more behind the scenes but both it's a fair point but i i think i mean my opinion is from the outside both sides are actually really up for a fight to be honest i think mm. the, the mm. studios really want to show their shareholders and they want to put down a few markers even if they lose some points they, they know how to play this game and the actors are just not tolerating this anymore so i think if even if Tom Cruise is standing between them, Mission Impossible style, trying to hold them apart and having no effect, I think that kind of goes to show like how serious the two sides are taking this. It is. And it is. I mean, it's 
kind of massive. It really is massive. Maybe we should explain, in case anyone doesn't know, um, what the SAG strike is, what they're striking for, what they want, what does SAG mean, what does AFTRA mean, um, what does AMPTP, what does it mean? And let's see, if we go through that, uh, and then we can start delving into sort of what we're thinking about it and what we think is going to happen. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is the big thing is about how the industry has shifted. And that these these deals come around every three years. So if they don't mm-hmm. sort out a new deal this time around, then, you know, it's, it's six years between the... Years. Yes. Exactly, yeah. So it can be quite a lot. And what we've seen is the, the world has shifted so much around streaming. And so the streaming is so different for the back end for the actors than it was than tv because there's far fewer episodes and then they get far fewer residuals the extra money so the whole economy of being a a working successful actor Mm -hmm. has just fundamentally changed with streaming and at the same time these streaming sites that are making a lot of money the people in charge are making huge amount of money and they're not really sharing it out so there's it's not only about money but money is one of the big things that is causing people to get out there there's that fact isn't there about the the medicare like so 13 percent of actors working in america qualify for health care under the amount that they're earning uh, it's actually worse than that i think that's 13 percent of sag members Mm, so like there are actors oh wow even even worse even worse there's there's many more actors who aren't on sag who don't earn Mm. anywhere near that it's a yeah. real problem to yeah, not yeah. have health insurance. You've got to earn over, I think it's twenty six thousand four hundred dollars a year, and it's, like yeah. you say, only thirteen percent actors do that a year. And there's a lot of working actors within that. This isn't people who are sat on the bums going, "Oh, I'm an actor." And there's that's people who are on TV shows constantly, and they're not managing to make that. So you can see why those people who are on shows, they are bit parts on stuff, or they've got great parts, or even if the background or stunt people, they're not getting paid enough. Uh, to get them through, you know, and that's really important, having to do second jobs. I'm sure people that listen to this podcast um, understand that, you know, not everyone on the screen is making millions of dollars. Um, there are people who stood next to like Tom Cruise that are, you know, are, are, are worrying about getting health care for their family and for themselves. And, and that's a that's a horrible position for people to be in. And it's, so it's not just about greed. It's not just about people wanting to make more money. I mean, you look at that stat, you know, Dom said and, and Stephen, it's like, 26 grand a year like you know most actors are making less than 20 how do you survive you know as in that? Dollars, and, and in, dollars, and in new york know? and la where a lot of them will be based these are not cheap places to live definitely mm. and this is where you know the residuals come in where that's usually is how people made their money you know and now it's changed i think that an actor came out who said he made more m- more money for night appearing in 19 episodes of the office um, you know, which ended in 2013, than he did from leading four series of um, what we do in the shadows. I think it was, mm. um, and that's crazy. 13 episodes as a guest star to being a lead, and you're making less money, and and that's that's the issue. That's the problem, and I think that really solidifies, mm. you know. Well, how residuals have changed in this time. So yeah, it's a big worry. It's being chipped away in a number of places. So there's the amount people are being paid up front, but then there's also the amount they're getting residuals. But then there's also fewer episodes per show. So if you think about a streaming series, it's more likely to be 10, 12 rather than 22. So there's less cumulative money there. And then the studios are trying to chip away at other things that you'd imagine that either would be an income stream for actors or cost them something. So the two other big issues or two of the other uh, of the other issues that they're chatting about is one, the idea that uh, a studio could pay you a one day fee, scan your body and then own your image rights forever, mm. which paying once and owning it forever is the way Hollywood we used to have DVDs and VHS and now yeah. we have to pay every month to watch the same thing now Hollywood wants to flip it on its head they want to own it for one time fee but you know whatever but mm. so that is crazy mm-hmm. yeah. How, yeah how is I mean it's if it's crazy. like if, it, if it's a million if it's like a million or something then then fair enough but you know, there is, how can they even publicly justify it's a that? negotiating that's, that's position the thing. there's it, no way so they, ludicrous there's no way they is, think this yeah. is real yeah. Well, yeah. This is, like, you know yeah. I've, I said this last time yeah. this is like the studios are the best lawyers and, and the actors and writers are the best storytellers they, this is a public negotiation they're trying to shame each other and impress their members or mm. stockholders like we we are all in the crowd what eating the popcorn and so we're like boo like they know what they're doing mm. they're playing at their heel they know what to do but yeah. there's so there's there's that and then the other thing is there's little things around the edges where if the if the rules don't update with the way that the world changes and if that only happens on the studio's terms everything will increasingly get worse for actors if the if the 
unions don't put their foot down. So self ta- self tapes is a good example where mm. auditions are becoming increasingly self taped, partly because they had to during the pandemic, but also technology makes it easier. Everyone's got camp cameras, and also once you get into that, but like that process is not regulated the way that a uh, normal casting process would be. So actors are doing free labor there through arduous processes and timing, and not that they'd always be paid for auditions, but still the process is chipping away. You're getting less upfront, less in the future. More things are being denied for you that would have been income streams and more things are costing you to do it. And so, yeah, the, the SAG need to put their foot down on and have on a number of these things. Otherwise, actors don't get anything for free. All these, you know, everything from credits to residuals to everything has come from the unions demanding it and forcing the studios to give it up. The studios haven't chosen anything in the history of film to give mm. to other people. I think I saw a, a stat and I'm, I'm not sure if it's 100 percent true but it was if two percent of the uh ceos of the major studios took a two percent cut if all the 10 studio heads did that it would pay for all of the demands from the entire negotiation yeah, easily right. yeah, yeah it's not hard wow. this is point of principles they're trying to show their stockholders they also are insulated they're also doing some nasty stuff as well like one of the studios which mm. i won't name just so that i don't have the details wrong deliberately pruned a load of trees near one of one of the strikes was going on oh, and yeah, they, that, yeah. they initially claimed they had permission and then the, they got fined a couple yeah. of hundred bucks they can afford the fine they're just this is very much playing yeah. a role and it's just mm. it's in poor taste but I guess I guess we don't know, we don't know exactly what's going on. It's almost like a, a saga for Christie novel that we're trying to decipher. <laughs> so to be clear, um, <laughs> SAG-AFTRA, which is the Screen Actors Guild and the American Federation of TV and Radio Artists, they're striking after the contract expired with AMPTP, yep. which is the American Motion Picture and TV Producers, and they're asking for better pay and job security. And under better pay becomes residuals. So. MPTP, they're repping people like Netflix, um, NBC Universal, uh, CBS, etc. Basically, the big companies. And it sounds like the actors are striking against the producers, which they are. Mm. They're not necessarily striking against the indie film or the producers who are trying to, you know, make films all the time. Well, it's the system, isn't it? It's the system they're they're striking out. Yeah. So, what do we think is going to happen, Phil? Hawkins is literally in the middle of casting his latest film right now, which is shooting very soon. And I wanted to know if this has affected you in any way. Personally, I mean, I wouldn't lie if it hasn't made me nervous. You know, I think look, legally, it's a UK film. Everyone's under equity contracts. Mm. Um, some of our actors are probably... S- SAG uh, actors too mm-hmm. um, but under UK labour law like they can't walk you know under an equity contract they can't walk from our production yeah th- at the moment they're allowed to work on equity yes. contracts UK, UK stuff, stuff. Yeah. yeah UK yeah, yeah which is under equity contract so you can you can be a SAG Ooh. member and an equity member um, but if you've got an equity contract then you you carry on working uh, you know as normal because they're not that's not with a signatory company to the a- a- M- a- M- T- P- T- a- a- M- P- T- P. Um So, but yeah, but the, the problem is, is it, now it's a, you know, Stephen said, it's like, it's about optics, right? So bigger actors that, you know, were talking to and discussing with the film, do they want to look like they're crossing the picket line, even though they're not mm. and, and working while other acts are striking? Now, legally, 100% they can, but like, do they want to? And our worry, or my worry, was when we're making these offers to certain talent that are on a certain level that, you know, it, they <laughs> I have to I have to skirt around who these people are. But like, you know, they're the kind of people that they're. Who are like, they, Phil? <laughs> is it Tom Cruise? Have you got Tom Cruise? <laughs> For obvious yeah. sake, it's Tom Cruise. Is, um, it, is it the guy standing around Tom Cruise? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the guy behind the shoulder. If you if you squint, it's that guy. Um, no, but um, you know. You could, you could, if they wanted to, you could say a nasty article could come out and go, look at that famous actor working. Now, what was great was when Mark Ruffalo came out and said, we all should be doing indie film because then there's a public consciousness <laughs> about, oh, okay, there's a difference between the big scary corporation and the indie filmmakers um, that mm. are trying to make film. Now, the film I'm making, is, it's a big indie, but it's, it's you know, it, it's, a, it's an indie, essentially. So I was worried that, yes, legally people can work, but are people going to take offers? And, and luckily, you know, people have been responding, agents have been responding and things like that, you know, which has been great. 
because there was nervousness that that would just stop and 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 then affect us um because i'm four weeks out from shooting basically wow. so um oh, wow. so, i mean i guess it's better know. than you being four weeks into shooting or whatever like i, I can imagine oh yeah the, the yeah. people that have had a harder time because there was talk about this uh, yeah. in Cannes this year when it was still all sort of possible but certainly people who were risk averse or just responsible for the money were certainly thinking well maybe we'll just slow ball the development until we see if there's going to be a strike because can you imagine being being seven days in like all of the cost and set up all of that it's just going to be it could destroy productions well it, it was the bond company bond you know they were refusing to bond certain films at a certain level because of the fear of it coming you can't bond you can't finance mm. blah, blah, blah. so that was the worry and it happened you know there was that high profile one a few years after cam where those cast members landed and then turned around and flew out you know, um, can't remember the names of them. It's been a long day. Sorry, but um, that 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 did happen. Um, so yeah, so I'm relieved that there's still potential out there. And you know, I would say this would be amazing if you know if you want to. This is now is the time to get Meryl Streep in your short film, guys. Like <laughs> you know, um, Tobias, like, if you're listening, you know, so over. as long as the fees are lower, first class, but, um, yeah. you know, or insert name here. How fascinating yeah. would that be to have mm. these indie films with these brilliant, massive actors? Which you know, Joe Public would see them just as a big movie because it's got Mark Ruffalo in it, and you know, very true. Um, but I, if I was the uh, the production, if I was the completion bond company, my fear would be that let's say that the strike gets resolved tomorrow, and Meryl Streep's on the plane, she's definitely dropping your movie. Like, no, no offense, but like yeah. everyone's keen to get back to work. And also once the strike is cooled off and everything's been agreed, which will happen at some point in some way, it could mm. could be, you know, 12 months. It could be 12 days. It, who knows? But the point is that everyone will want then then there'll be like this because there's been an interruption to the pipeline. And so everyone will be pushing yeah. very hard to get these productions back up and running. And so it's it's the disruption. A huge money will be huge money will be thrown from the studios. Like when it is resolved, I mean, assuming it will be resolved. All of the streamers, all of the big studios are going to be throwing outrageous offers, I would imagine, uh, to secure cast and get straight back into production. Well, the other side of that is the ones that they've stopped, they will have to go and continue filming or the ones that were about to start. So there'll be, a, yeah. again, it's kind of after the COVID situation, there might be that backlog where backlog. suddenly everyone's mm. filming, it's crazy, there's no crew and cast, and then it'll drop again yeah which is kind of what's happening now it's going to affect like one of the things that covid really did as well when it when we started to open up was it really affected the crew rates like mm. people were having to pay more to get the same people and so because i think mm. the crew is somebody we should really p bear in mind here because i think largely there's a lot of you know support solidarity between cast and crew and all these different unions they're fighting the same fight in different ways and a victory for one is usually a victory for the other even if not directly however these are the people who are not going to be able to work you know these people who are putting food on the table and i'm not suggesting they that the actors are doing this anything you know for any bad reason or whatever but it's it's reality and certainly the last long writer strike affected the crews hugely but then there'll be this weird interruption when the strikes you know are cooled off and then the crew are being offered huge amounts of money to go but they can only do one day in one day you know what i mean now there'll be all this push to work long hours and weekends and do multiple things and like it's just so disruptive to an already kind of quite chaotic industry but that normally there's a bit more smooth thing so it's this is one of the arguments that people like tom cruise and whatever are saying against the strike is not to say the studios are right but to say look there's there's such a big disruption yeah. here mm. and it's really unfair on the crew members there's so massively, many yeah massively. massively unfair on the dps everyone going down to grip to production coordinators to pas it's suddenly now they're not working anymore those jobs have stopped and they're not on the picket lines. You know what I mean? They're not going, we demand more. Even and though they don't know how long this is for either. So exactly. they can't just go on holiday. They can't no. go and take another job. Like no. uh, this uncertainty is one of the worst things about it. But I, I got to say that I, well, you're asking how long you think it will go on for. I mean, the the I don't know. Maybe you guys have read this stat as well. But what percentage of the actors voted in favour of this strike? Do oh, no, are... I don't. No, yeah, we're doing a quiz. Are we doing what's a quiz? The, yeah. I'm, okay, I'm, going so with, I'm going with 94. There we go. Okay, Dom says 94. Phil, what's your guess? What percentage of the SAG members voted uh, for? I, th I thought it was higher, actually. So 96. Okay. I think it was 83. Phil, for the first time you got closest, it was 98%. <gasps> wow. 
Can we just savor this moment, everyone? Just <laughs> no, a little let's move on. Just a moment so 98%. In silence this, no, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. no, 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 this is more important. <laughs> <Okay>. Basically, <laughs> this is the big, first time Phil might have is... got a point off the bat. Can I, can I just point out? 2%, 2% of people care about Bill's victory. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, you, you got it less wrong than the other two. I don't know why you count that as a victory. Yeah, that's The number true. you guessed Ooh, was yeah, still yeah. wrong. Still uh, still well, you lost less, but whatever. But the best amongst the losers. Yeah. But no, but 98 Eight percent of people, and not only that, that the vote was actually wow. before they went into the negotiations. So what they basically said mm. was, when the vote came out, look, we're about to go into these crunch talks with the studios. If we do, as the executive committee or the negotiating committee decide to strike, would you support us? So that was slightly blind. I mean, not completely blind. They had policies and whatever, but that's a huge. I wonder which actors did the motivational speeches for that. <laughs> they, I think, yeah, like we got Kendall <laughs> <the best>. Roy, <laughs> all the Oscar winners. <laughs> <laughs> but that's unpre- that's a huge amount of support, isn't it? And mm. so. I'm sure that the studios have got across the board support there, but we don't know because they don't have the public conversations. They don't need to. There's probably only 20 people need to get into a room for them. So we'll all agree. But the actors is a bit more public and whatever. But that's such a high percentage of people who just who are putting their own li- livelihoods and the livelihoods of their c- crew that they care about on the line. But they in the end decided almost almost to a man and to a woman like this needs to happen. That's so this could go on for a while. Uh, everyone's posturing quite, I mean, quite hard at the moment. But yeah, who knows? I mean, I think, I think, I think the issue is like from the just the way that big companies work. They, they, you know, they they can hold out, and I think there is an element of face here. Like even if they are going to agree to everything, like even if they literally agreed to every single demand, they're not going to do it instantly because if they do do that, there is the chance that there it will, you know, there'll be a ricochet sort of knock on effect with every other. Oh, it's union guaranteed. Starting yeah, strike. they smell weakness. Guaranteed. Or you get, yeah. I mean. Exactly. That's it. So, so it's like it, it's it's a, it's a difficult position, you know. Regardless of of what the outcome is, is going to be, because there is going to be some kind of built in delay on seceding to any demands for that reason. Mm. And there's big money at play. Like the studios combined, the ones that are that are at the table at the moment, their profits. Oh, do you, I don't know. Wait, do you guys want to guess? Let's all do right, another quiz. Come on. All right, this is the oh, yeah. all right, right. Yep. Combined profits. I'm out. No, no, Phil, you're going <laughs> leave first. Leave the this table time. in the you know, casino. You no. leave the table, right? I'm, I'm finally, gone. finally beat okay. Phil. <laughs> so, what, what is the combined profits uh, of the studios yeah. that are part of members on this negotiation topic last year? Not turnover uh, profits. Is it? Is that in, sorry? It's studios and streamers. Yeah. So that's a good question. So this, there's the studios that have streaming arms, and essentially they are largely. Yeah. And then there's the streamers as well, yeah. and it includes both of them. Um, okay. Because Apple okay. and Netflix. Uh, Phil goes first. Oh, yeah. oh winner, winner goes, goes first. first. Yeah, yeah. Winner from the previous yeah. round. Well, uh, do you know? Uh, yeah. It's an ask. Come out of money. Um, billions. Yeah. Um, so Don't I'm going to go. Them a clue. I, <laughs> Three? No, I mean it's got to no, be billions, said, isn't yep. it? Yeah. I, th- I thought yeah. I, I thought you meant the TV show Billions because that's included. <laughs> yeah. That's on strike. <laughs> oh. um, there he is. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, two point four. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry, two point four dollars or billions? Just checking so that you don't... dollars and billions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going for four point eight. Four point eight. Okay. I'm going to four hundred eighty-three billion. Four hundred and eighty three billion. Yeah, I might be closest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean now now it doesn't sound so much. Judging by Stephen <laughs> I just you're the only person I've ever met who made the studio profit system not sound like a lot of money. Uh, yeah. It was twelve billion last year. Twelve billion. Wow. I sorry, I win, I win. Don't get the point. <laughs> I'm the least Congrats, wrong. Tom. That's amazing. The least worst, the best worst, <laughs> <laughs> whatever Stephen oh, said, that thing. Big, best loser. Wait, but that tw- was just last year, Stephen. Yeah, you said. yeah, just the studio profits. Mm. Uh, Twelve, and also that's that's increased mm. quite a bit uh, in the last few years. I don't have the numbers mm. of previous years, but that's that's high on on a thing. But it's just, I mean, that's why when when people talk about how high the salaries are, the mm. CEO, yes, they're staggeringly high. But when you look at the money that the company's making, it doesn't seem so bad. But then when you look, I'm not saying it's okay. Mm. I'm just saying that it's a much, 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 much more number. Yeah. yeah. But then you look at the people that they're making the money through which is the cast and crew and how badly and it's just another Mm. order of magnitude and it's just like so patently i don't think you have to be a communist or a socialist to think this is not a fair distribution 12 billion and you know it is it's and when you put it into context like that you go well they're not asking for that much here there isn't that much the actors are striking for i think and jumping back a little bit into why i think there was 98 percent uh voted for the strike ai we haven't talked about this yet and i think that's a good segue back into it because just before 
they were building up to doing the writer strike and talking about it, AI had become massive. It still is massive, but it became the biggest talking point. And I think a lot of actors, not only writers and directors, have become very wary and worried about this. Hence why the uh, WGA, the Writers Guild of America, are striking as well, is because of AI. So let's mm. talk about that as well within the actors and the issues surrounding it. Well, there are different types of AI that we're talking about. I mean, obviously, the, the same existential threat is around the replacement of human beings to do something with a computer. Um, or And it might be things like images or or the processes of writing but fundamentally they're using two different things so the writers are worried about large language models um like gpt3 or gpt4 or chat gpt all those that that's just all the open ai ones but that's about generating ideas content or even rewriting or redrafting that's a little more complicated because it can generate ideas it can write stuff it can rewrite stuff but it it does some jobs well some jobs badly it'll change and so that's going to be harder to guard against because it is used in the background like a laptop or a spell check it's much much harder to to know whether someone's done it you kind of you can if you replace the writer with an ai that's easy but if the writer uses it it's complicated what we're talking about with actors is generative ai which is image based and and the video stuff that is starting to come out at the moment it looks like a weird fever dream and i highly recommend you check out how they're looking now because they are dali-esque surreal videos that but they're generated from text and so what we're looking at is very soon in a, in a workable time frame and within the next three years as in when the next negotiation comes up it seems entirely plausible not guaranteed but plausible that you're going to be able to just not just at the moment they can manually through uh through visual effects replace faces and we've seen that a lot you know fast enough Furious had pull what you know all lots mm-hmm. of things going on but this is about being able to generate indiana jones ge- generate new images and new content through having the model and being able to type things in and you know going much further than say you know andy circus's work and all that kind of stuff it's sort of halfway house between an actor there is an actor but it's also generative but so yeah what they're one of the things the studios have said is they want to be able to scan an actor and own those the image of those actors to be able to create automatic new content and like that i think that's easier to guard against i think it's there's a copyright image there there's also images it's also using something that already exists your likeness as opposed to the writer's large language model stuff which is about creating something new and you don't really see it how do you know where this script came from because mm. all scripts are typed in the same format whereas if you steal paul walker's image or you know some up and coming actor gives you the right to use their image and becomes famous you'll see that that's a a young leader of DiCaprio or whatever so mm-hmm. it's interesting because what they've suggested is so unreasonable that anything else that they come up with in you know to follow to follow it up no, no, welcome no, to hollywood son <laughs> 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 Anything else they come up with on the AI front will be far more reasonable sounding than what they've already come up with. So, I mean, there is that, which is kind of interesting to me. Mm. So, Phil, if you could scan all your actors... Uh, and obviously, you being a, a good guy at this point, you know, you're a good guy working on it. Who's, who's to say he hasn't? Yeah. <laughs> and, like, and, and be able to do something in the edit. Is there a kind of, like, obviously, we're thinking the studios want to steal people's identity and, and do it without paying anyone. But there is also a, a, another route into the same place where, as an artist, you want to be able to, you know, you might do ADR and change. You realize there's a plot hole or something. And so you re record some audio with the actors and place it in. Would, does it appeal to you to be able to have a, a fully you know 3d model of the actors that you can then control it uh, with some text and and fix the edit oh definitely i mean as, as a director that likes to line read their actors and uh, puppet <laughs> them uh, i would um yeah <laughs> no i mean absolutely ridiculous uh, absolutely not i mean yes we adr things but yeah the things with the talent mm. <laughs> you know as the the cliche goes the third mode in writing like the re- rewriting in post you know mm-hmm. um but no, like, no way. I mean, yes, I, as a tool to, like, put my very expensive actor who, you know, can't ride a motorcycle on top of a market, <laughs> think of Skyfall, <laughs> <laughs> and then plunk that on Daniel Craig's face, you know, and use AI to ah, make that. Daniel Craig's in your film. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, he said he had a problem but, with the Bond company. It wasn't that. Yeah, <laughs> literally a <laughs> Bond company. Very good. Um, very good. <laughs> oh, very good, Stephen. Very good. Okay, now um, it doesn't sound so good, but... Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, in answer to the question, to just be able to, like, drag and drop an actor and change them in the edit, I mean, it's, 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 it's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. 
you know, and, and, <laughs> and you can see how producers would go like, oh yeah, do you remember all those reshoots? You know, there's no reshoot stories it's, anymore. It, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. authenticity shredding is what it is. Yeah, it's, it, it it's, just it's it, it gets rid of that. I mean, even you know, even ADR, it's difficult to capture the moment in the film. If this is like another yeah. step beyond that, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, yeah. But you can see why that you might want to use it as a tool. You know, um, uh, you you can see why, like on paper, this looks like a good idea yeah. and worth investing. For reindeer in. actors, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drag and drop animals and stuff. But um, but yeah, but uh, you know, no, ab- absolutely not. Well, the key the key questions here are, are twofold. One is about consent, and mm-hmm. you know, consent is is paying people appropriately but also just getting their permission but uh i guess the other thing is about the moral rights and so the moral right of an author is you know the right to be recognized as the author even if you're not paid and one of some of the things that the deals that the unions do with the studios aren't necessarily about money so for example you look at the writers guild and how regulated the writers credits are whether they get credited how they get credited and things like that like it's sometimes that as well the idea that the studios would own your image which is everything you have it is, you know, especially if they can use that to create a performance and your livelihood is doing new performances, it is taking, it's not, you don't have to go airy fairy and say it's taking your soul, but it's taking your livelihood. It's copying and pasting who you are and what you provide and then not compensating you for it in the future because you're in, a, Knock off Nigel, yeah. because yeah, because you're in a vulnerable position, you know, like there's, there's, it doesn't feel a million miles away from the way, less so now, although it's, I'm sure it still happens, but certainly if you go back 20 years, the way that the studio system would get young actors and actresses to to be naked mm-hmm. in the film because they just desperately wanted to be in a movie and they'd be paid almost nothing and they'd have no control over the image of their body and things like that. It's better, but it's not like it's still it's still a bit of that out there. But the the idea was that you just were so desperate and then you'd go and regret those life choices, but it would be seared onto film and someone else would own that. So there's a certain amount of it anyway because you do sign over rights but it's not a fair value exchange and there's no consent going on and i think it's it's distasteful as well as we're learning what these new technologies can do and consent is everything because we create performances in the edit all the time mm, <laughs> and edits can hurt them in terms of picture mm-hmm. and we play with changing lines from other takes and we do all that and and that that feels okay that feels real and raw but actually that's it captured. is a huge amount of manipulation isn't it one, but that's what that's what editing is like, come mm. on who hasn't mm. made a performance better by yeah of course absolutely. you know yeah. editing th- and chopping it and change, like 100 percent. well the argument would be then that you we've got used to these kinds of like controls and lack mm. of consent but not others and so that that's would almost, what i was thinking <laughs> yeah that almost supports i mean it is one of the things about ai we're all having to rethink what it means i mean the whole concept of copyright is going to have to be rethought in the next decade or so because look how quickly and easy it is for you to generate your concept art it fundamentally changes even if you're not putting someone out of a job today it fundamentally changes some of the ideas around this and i think perhaps i mean who knows there is a there is a future where actors have to realize that they will get scanned once and maybe there's a residual you know i mean we had this actually when the the vhs started to come out Mm. the concept of a pre-recorded thing that the audience would own at home was a whole new idea because we previously had movies that were in cinemas and that was it. Then there was this whole fight in the late 40s around TV rights and stuff like that. That was kind of new, but that was still kind of broadcast time dependent, right? It goes out, it's gone. Then with VHS starts to come in, the idea that the consumer would own a copy they could watch whenever they wanted, as much as they wanted, was a whole new paradigm of control over image and rights. And that's how the studio started to that's how the union started to say, well, we should get some of that money. And the studios went, well, it's a new technology. We'll give you 20% of what we normally would. And then they never updated that. Hence a lot of the stuff in the late 2000s were, you know, the right of strike and things like that. But that is where we have to get to with this AI. It's a whole new paradigm, whether it's writing or performance or anything else, that we haven't wrapped our heads around. And if we let the studios decide what's normal, mm. I don't think any of the Probably performance... not best for us. No, <laughs> I, they're looking out for themselves, as they should, and that's what they're doing, and that's what they say they're doing. But that's what's at stake here, is, is, is saying, no, this needs to be regulated. So it might well be that actors do have to be paid a fee for their image rights to be used to generate new stuff, but it will be regulated. It will be a certain amount per year or a certain amount per show or something. I don't know. Like, we've got to invent this. Mm-hmm. And it may not be this round of, of strikes that do it. might do be it. in three years' time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The next yeah, and, and, then, and then what do you do if you get pirated? You know, yeah, someone your, downloads the source. Your likeness mm-hmm. gets pirated. Yeah, well, you've yeah. had that with video games, you know, actually. You could, have, you could have, like, a Giles Butler or <laughs> <laughs> any kind of, you know, 
there's 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 such big applications like for the future in terms of when we have holograms and you know, even in sort of home computers, home robots, those kind of things will be the future one day. And, it, and people's likeness will be part of yes, that. Yes, certainly will. You mentioned before then about uh, the WGA and the, the writers strike a little bit. Well, let's just touch on that slightly. What's happening? It's kind of gone quiet. Um, perhaps, you know, we could maybe just touch on what we think's happening. I think that the, the, the writers know full well. The writers, and they want to make sure that the actors have got their time in front of the camera. It doesn't mm-hmm. make sense for them both to be shouting different, slightly different things about mm-hmm. the same people. Also, you want to make sure there's no fatigue. The actors are more interesting to the press because there's more famous people in it. It's a new thing. Yeah, lots and, of famous people. Yeah, exactly. And so mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure there's some coordination going on because we don't know what's going on behind the scenes with the negotiating committees. And, and the mm. two strikes are not really linked. They, they are covering the similar issues because they live in the same world. And they are happening around the same sort of time because of a quirk of negotiation and that gives them more collective power. But ultimately, they're two separate strikes campaigning against the same you know, set of bodies of the studios entities. So, uh, mm. but I think that when it comes to the the public side, it makes sense for them. That, and I'm sure there will be a come a point in, let's say that both the strikes carry on for a while and a couple of weeks where suddenly the news seems mm. to turn and it's all the writers again and the actors are quiet mm. for a bit. That's very clever negotiation by people who, let's be honest, <laughs> understand show business. But this mm. is special because I mean, there hasn't, there hasn't been a writer strike and a SAG strike um, for 60 years, yeah. 60 years. It? Yeah. yeah. So mm. it is, you know, it is kind of a special mm. time. At the same time. It um, makes, me, makes me wonder whether the studios have, so, someone in the studios, I, I have no evidence <laughs> of this, but I do wonder if they sat there and thought, well, we can't make anything anyway. <laughs> Why not have them all out on strike? What is the difference? <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's true. Though. Two yeah, strikes yeah, yeah, yeah. is not two lots yeah, yeah. of money. Send some offensive notes to, <laughs> to the actors. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it would make sense. But who's going to write them? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. AI. The AI. <laughs> <laughs> All at the same time. So, look, how do you think this is going to affect us as indie filmmakers? You know, this is the thing we're talking about as directors, producers, filmmakers, creators. What, especially in the UK, but across the world, what do you think is going to happen? How is this affecting us right now? Well, and will do. The General Secretary of Equity has come out and said, you know, they're strike ready because equity. Uh, negotiate next year yes. with Pat. Mm-hmm. Um, they've already put in their and deal. And they're saying they're strike ready. Yeah, th- yeah they've asked for, the same... for similar. Uh, they want 15% increase in pay. That's what Equity have asked. Pact already. And probably the same residual, residual secondary AI payments. Provision. Very similar mm-hmm. to SAG. Right. So they've already yeah. put that premise in. So there probably will be a strike. Um, it depends. It depends how good the solution is here because a lot yes. of the things that we have in the industry now, like credit systems and lots of checks and balances and residuals, are very, neg- very carefully negotiated and documented and adjudicated. And I know as being a UK producer in the past, we would often say we're using um, Writers Guild terms, even though it's not a Guild project, mm. anywhere near a Guild it's project. True. But yeah. they've done all the hard work in figuring it all out. And me as a producer, I want to give the appropriate credit to the writers. I don't know what that is. And smarter people than me have spent years figuring it out. So sure, whatever they say is the way that we negotiate this and we work out who's first, second, third, whatever. Mm. I agree in advance. What I'm about in terms of productions what about in terms of making things at the moment phil is four weeks away from shooting and fingers crossed that all moves forward do we think it's going to have a big knock-on effect you know i know we touched on this in the beginning but i i know i'm talking to a lot of producers at the moment and i'm making things as a director and also producing films and they are moving forward they are happening well i mean it's it's it's, it's simple for i mean it's not simple but it's there's a lot less risk for UK productions. If you're doing anything international, um, especially sort of any any kind of company that might have affiliation with America, things become a lot more tricky. Um, and you're then in the territory of, well, do I move it out of America or do I try and get a waiver? And getting a waiver is obviously very new territory. And there's probably a huge inundation mm. of waiver applications going to SAG at the moment. There is. Um, so, so, you know, it, it's, I mean, uh, Filmmaking is always up in the air, but there's a huge, you know, level beyond the norm in this situation. And uh, it, could, it could certainly put investors very much at unease. Well, when you're talking about big names, mm. big actors, yes. I think in terms of us getting projects made and done, I don't think there's any difference for us indie film. Do it with mm. our talent. Um, we've just got to be careful our actors 
don't jump out. And right now there is crew. Some of the best crew out mm-hmm. there because the big ones are, yeah. are the international productions with the big stars and those people aren't yeah. working. I think that you've got two major effects and one is immediate and one will take time to filter through. So the immediate one is uncertainty and that helps nobody. Like mm-hmm. nobody, the mm-hmm. films are so expensive. They need so, even the cheap, even a cheap indie film is mm-hmm. costing huge amounts of money and there's, and there's lo- loads of risk involved for so many people along the chain that we don't need more. And so even as we talked about, like, yeah, you can probably get a top Top member of crew now for your production because they can't work elsewhere but if the strike is resolved next week they're going on that they're going back onto that and that'd have to be part of your negotiation so even the benefits are slightly uncertain but then the long term is well the, let's say medium term so let's say in six months or a year if the strike drags on for a while and you're able to shoot or complete a project you're work you're moving into a marketplace that has less content it has less mm-hmm. new fresh content and so if you have some smiling yeah so yeah <laughs> so what that means is that it's amping up people i'm, I'm not going to speak specifically about your your or your production <laughs> phil because i don't know but people like phil phil might be um, in the shop yeah well they're, they're going to have to deal with a lot more uncertainty now take much bigger risks now than they would have to otherwise and that that depends if they have the backing for that but if they manage to come mm. through the other side and if the strike does become meaningful to the pipeline which it's not yet it's a it's a blip right now because it's only just started mm-hmm. but if it goes on for six months or like the previous writer strike in the late 2000s was quite long then suddenly you know let's say can next year berlin next year at these film markets and phil or, or his producers or whatever are like i have a new film like mm-hmm. everyone else is like oh ooh, and it'll if it's a substitute to you know even a mild substitute to the things that they've the tap's been turned off for so i, I mean that's where real indie productions thrive uh, it's not I, I I wish it was better than that, as in I shouldn't have to, but in uncertain waters with having to zig and zag and try and do unusual things and fill in the gaps, zig and that's sag. where a good, yeah, zig and mm-hmm. sag, very nice. That's where mm-hmm. the indie producers really thrive, is being able to see an opportunity. So you think about how much Disney puts out, all the streamers combined. If every indie was able to shoot all their films, first of all, there would be a, wouldn't be nearly enough for the, you know, just a number. But then also what the audience thinks is a suitable substitute. And if we're all used to seeing a hundred million dollar movie by The Rock be dropped on a random Tuesday on Netflix, then we're gonna, we're not gonna have like some thought, thoughtful small indie film and think it's like mm. Coda, for example. Coda is a fantastic mm-hmm. film. But let's say that was an indie film mm. that was made during a strike. Let's say hypothetically, I don't think that's ever going to be a substitute for the things they're lacking so it may be used to plug a gap but fundamentally what indies can do and what do well or do well is not what the studios fundamentally do until they do do well mm-hmm. i mean think of how many studio copies of everything ever at once were currently in production yeah. <laughs> you know or being written well they but, were you know, until the last couple of know, weeks yeah yeah <laughs> you know so yeah. you know i'm just i'm just trying to think of the you know the the other side of the the, the coin you know it's kind of like you know maybe there are interesting films that come out that that because there aren't the big tentpole you know superhero movies you know maybe some do plug a gap and actually do break out and then the studios go oh maybe those mid 90s thrillers or whatever they are that mm. you know we inverted yeah, commas don't and, make and anymore kind of yeah mm-hmm. maybe they break out i mean mm. look at coda i mean wonderful wonderful film i mean that was one of the biggest sundance you know sales mm. in in recent history to apple you know so it, it, so there is value didn't have the rock in it though know, didn't have the rock in it <laughs> but maybe the rock mm-hmm. can be in your memento you know, what's mm-hmm. it? Yeah, <laughs> well, there we go. So, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just kind of spitballing a maybe a bit of positivity. You know, those, uh, you know, maybe maybe there's a maybe because of that content gap. Maybe there is a way of indies are being made that that you can get things over the line more than you normally would have done. Yes, possibly. and to, and to put it out there, look, we're standing in solidarity with what is happening right now with these strikes we've said this on the last podcast about the business of film talking about the writer's strike we stand in solidarity with that and the same with the actor strike but we are allowed to make films here at the moment i say allowed we are doing that and some people are saying no you shouldn't you shouldn't do that you should stand in solidarity and not make films I think that would be doing a disservice to the crews here and the people yeah. who are trying to make films and that have a career here, where it's very difficult anyway to have any kind yeah. of career as a filmmaker to suddenly stop and not do and there it. There wouldn't be the exceptions and there wouldn't be the, the waivers if if the intent was to stop independent films. Mm-hmm. Like we, it's never been about independent filmmakers. Yes, um, and Mark Ruffalo wouldn't have said what he said, yeah, which exactly. makes it 
okay and everyone's gone actually you're right go yeah. do it and look if people do thrive during this time and make an absolute winner of a film another code or another whatever film pulp fiction that you you, you climb through the gaps that you might not have done had all the big temple studio movies uh, mm-hmm. been coming around especially uh, mission impossible 2 a dead reckoning part two tricks such a films like that well you might not be competing with them now you might be competing with just the well, other indies more of a chance well we're looking for an optimistic note on all of this let me just remind you that what happened in, in the writer strike in the late 2000s was that it went on for a while so the studio started relying on more and more unscripted content because they couldn't get scripted content uh, which yeah. then made one of the most successful shows the apprentice which made donald trump president so i'm just saying <laughs> that just because people get through the gaps and manage to make it all the way to their dreams <laughs> does it I mean, they should. It doesn't mean they should, or that it will work <laughs> out well for yourself. us. I mean, make filmmaking yeah. great again, guys. You know, come on. <laughs> um. So, talking about actors, then, is this a time for actors to move to directing? Is this a time for? actors to go oh do you know then maybe i can make my own indie i can do that is this the perfect time and i thought as we have Stephen, and he writes brilliant articles on such things uh on his website stephenfollows.com we thought we'd ask you um what is there is should we do another quiz on sort of that ratio definitely and i imagine you've just got it at the top of your head Stephen. yeah um, <laughs> actors to directors actors to producers actors who've made their own yeah projects especially talking about barbie earlier you know and margot robbie and her production company and getting a brilliant deal three four years ago that made it able to make a barbie yeah i mean i, I think we think about these roles as, as very separate siloed things when we talk about the writer strike or the actor strike and yet uh first of all that people often take on multiple roles as we've discussed before but also i don't know whether people uh, you need to have a, a legal definition because there are unions and rules and stuff but when it comes to you as a performer or a creator quite often these are sort of slightly arbitrary things that don't match i mean most directors i know think of themselves and maybe not as a, i am a writer but they are a creator of something from nothing mm-hmm. and the shepherding of a uh, a production as a director in the ho- in all the stages of production is not a million miles away from creation and you know uh, lots of directors also maybe editors as well but um so let's um warm up into this topic so what i've got here is these are just pre-pandemic these are 20 years of, of films pre-pandemic uh, 30 years of right. films actually right. we're all getting ready all right, I think I can, our brains yeah. are back on Every, uh, so what, what i can see here on the zoom is two very happy faces very keen to guess because they have nothing <laughs> of their identity on the line and phil <laughs> Looks like he, he's doing someone else's specialist subject on Mark This is Mark. AI. I feel good inside. Uh. <laughs> um, so let's think right. about... So what, what I'm looking at now is this is across 30 years of films leading up to the pandemic, but I don't think the pandemic has any effect on this. And so I looked at all the people that have at least one credit on a feature film that was in cinema So uh, as a director. So we're looking at a cohort of people is they have directed at least once in a film that came out. Yeah. How are you still looking pained, Phil? I haven't finished the question. I was just closing my eyes. I'm visualizing. <laughs> I'm visualizing. I know you don't like answers, but I thought you were okay with questions. <laughs> Stephen, he's four weeks away from filming. This <laughs> is that place. This is a, this is a five a.m. start, and this is very yeah, late. Now. This is amazing. We've got him right. to do this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm loving this. Um, so, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the Dorian Gray to Phil at the moment. The worse he feels, the happier I am. Um, yeah. So okay. So of all the people that have directed a movie, let's just you know in yeah. that thirty year period, uh, let's do some warm up questions. These aren't for points. Don't worry, Phil. This is. Oh, this wait, no, no, they, oh, they are for points. All right, okay. Of course they're for All points. Right, they're for points. for points. What percentage of the people that have directed <laughs> at least once have also had at least one screenwriting credit on a movie? So is this, sorry, feature films? Feature films, or, yeah. Or feature films like, that have reached US okay. cinemas. So you can say like, but oh. that'll be indie and oh. studio, but the film has got somewhere. Okay. And so of the so people... what percentage have also got a screenwriting yeah, credit? Yeah, what percentage of directors have had at least one screenwriting credit? And it may not be on a different movie, the same movie. Before. 64%. Yeah. Strong start. Respect the game. Let's see. What do, what, what do you, uh, you think? 20, 23, 23%. Oh, so quite a different conception of like, okay, so you think about two thirds, Phil. Don't you think about a quarter? Where are you going, Giles? Okay, I'm going higher. I'm going higher than Phil. Um, I'm going to go 70, 70. 70, 70. Wait. The answer is 71%. <gasps> oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so anyway so that was that's the yeah. the, the role that's that, the easy one that's an that easy, easy one. that was the easy one right. no but the, the, the reason i started that one was to anchor us the idea that 
directors yeah. and writers often overlap and three quarters of people have directed have also had a writing credit. <laughs> Easy one. Mm. So, it's huge. So what we need to, we're move, now moving on to cast. So yeah. this is kind of interesting because before I ask you the question, we have to think about what does it mean to be a cast member? Um, so, okay, I was about to do this for, for no points as well, but I seem to be like, uh, no, okay. That's silly. Here is one. That's why we're here. What I'm going to accept here is the first <laughs> one of the three of you that give you the right answer. And you, you can give me as many answers as you want. Okay. So there is a director who you've definitely heard of who has played, who has been credited in movies. And I'm going to read out three credits this person has. Please, uh, mm. uh, They have been credited as party guest in Vanilla Sky, as an mm-hmm. alien in Men in Black, and mm-hmm. as popcorn eating man in Jurassic Park 2. Bonnie, Barry Sonnefield? No. Nope. Mm. Keep going, though. With, keep with as many guesses as you want. Oh, uh, David uh, Kett? No. No. Nope. No, but they're a director. Director. Um, uh, Tar- Quentin Tarantino? Nope. Uh, Robert That's Rubius. all the directors I know in the world. <laughs> he, made one of the movie- he made one of the movies I just mentioned. Oh, he made one of the movies? Okay, so he did a character. So it's not Cameron Crowe? No. No, it's not Cameron Crowe. You said uh, one oh, of the it- others already. So hang on. So Oh, wait. So, so it has to be Ridley Black- Scott. Many- no. Many- no, Men in Black right. 2, yeah. Vanilla Sky, the No, the it was Tom Vanilla Cruise. Sky, Men in Black, and then there was the third one I said, which was Jurassic Park 2. Yeah, well, that, 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 oh, is that not Spielberg? Did he not do the second one? No, he did the second one, Spielberg, yeah. Yeah, it was Spielberg. So I get the Spielberg. points. I, I said it. Yeah, I said did it. you? I, I <laughs> did you? know that question. Should, how did we all not answer Spielberg? I, 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 did I didn't hear you, Don, but I'll, 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 we'll do, we do an honest system yeah, on this podcast. All right, Don gets the point. Did Don say it? Did you say it? I said it just now, yeah. Well, what do you mean just now? (laughs) After I said it. (laughs) I'm going to say it now and edit it in later. (laughs) Child, you're the one who does the edit. So if you say it, I said it after you said Jurassic Park. Oh, well, you said Jurassic Park. I didn't didn't say it. Oh, my God. I don't give you a point. Tom gets the, the point. Answer. Okay, so he's in many right, black. I'll take it. Yeah, but he's, he's an alien on the TV screen. You know when they yeah, have quite a no, few of them. Just, yeah. So the same yes. question I asked about writers, but let's ask it about cast members. So the percentage of directors who've also had a proper acting credit on a movie. Um, 12%. And, uh, 12, do you say 12%? Okay. Yeah. It feels jump just, straight in. I like, I like how you're going for speed, Phil, over quality. But like, <laughs> <laughs> over quality. Hey, it could be right. <laughs> no, Wait, I'm going I, 22. You think 22? I'm going to think about this because if we think such a horrible answer before that, <laughs> this time it might there's work. So many directors who are going to have that credit because they're going to put themselves in a film or it's a cameo. That's a we've just dis- discussed now is an acting credit. Not only that, but you feature in other people's films. You're constantly on set, and they go, "Oh, go and do that for me." Bit of fun. This isn't a so filibuster. Just uh, give yes. us the answer. Yeah, yeah. Just the give L. us the question. So there's the files of us. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's either going to make you more smugly right or very wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's digging <laughs> a hole. We don't know what's <laughs> going on. Straight in. Just say a number. But I think yeah. this is huge because TV days. So many actors were constantly directing their own episodes. Um, oh, I just balls. think it's, I didn't think about no, that. I, it's just movies. It's just. It's just movies. Okay. Good. Oh, okay. I still think it's higher, but because I can get the point if I just go above Phil's. Or above Dom's, 22%. I'm going to go 25%. But I personally think it's much, much higher. I don't think you get to guess and say you think you're wrong. (laughs) I I think you're trying to get like the... You can prove me wrong. So please let's let's prove him wrong. Can I just (laughs) note that when when Phil was defending his answer a moment ago, he literally said to me, you don't know, I could be right. I'm like, no, I do know. (laughs) You're not. (laughs) That's a weird argument to have to me at this point. Uh, If a tree falls in the forest, no one hears it, blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, all that yeah, existential exactly. stuff. So the answer is twenty eight percent. Twenty eight percent of directors oh, have also me. starred, or also not necessarily starred as in leading, but they've had a proper acting role. That's quite high, I think. Yeah, because it's I, higher I, than I, I yeah. thought. Writing, yeah. directing, well, I see not as me. I thought it was similar high. kinds thought of things. Low. They're about creation and communication <laughs> of ideas, right? But yeah. starring and directing, I think, I know that there's overlap, but it, it, to me, that sounded like a high percentage. Mm. Um, mm. So my final kind of set of questions, or final question, really, but we can explore it in a few different ways. Actually, you know what? All of the points we've had so far mean almost nothing because I have two, four, Wait, six, what? eight, ten. I have 11 possible points on on offer for one <gasps> question in a minute. So, Phil, oh, Phil. No, no, that's, great. that's not fair. Um, no, that's not fair. Okay. Okay. It's because the scores at the fair. moment. You've just thrown it out the, thrown it out the window. The scores at the moment. Phil's got, Phil's got one. Mm. Me and Dom have got two. I've got one. So, just saying. Hurt, one. so hurtful. So hurtful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we're looking at here is people who have directed 
uh, but they're primarily known for being famous actors. And I got five here. So the all five of these are famous actors, You've uh, gender neutral, so you definitely know them. And they have directed at least one movie. And I'm going to, in some cases, a few. I'm going to let you know the movie and you're going to have to guess who the famous actor is. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Right. But they're not okay. acting in it necessarily. Not necessarily. I don't know. Some okay, are, okay, some okay. are not, right? Some, right. This is a, this is a cruel... It is. Cruel, cruel. Yeah. But Giles, I want you to keep I, I count. I finally won a quiz after <sighs> no, years no, no, of trying. No, no, no. You were winning a quiz. It's, you haven't won a quiz. Piece, one point each, yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm back in the game. What happens if we look like idiots and don't know any of them? This is very unreasonable. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's do it. Oh, we're Let's gonna, do it. Should, should, we, should I start easy or start hard? What should I do? Easy. All right. Easy. We'll start easy. First person to shout out the, Steven the Spielberg. actors. <laughs> Actor. Clint Eastwood. That directed okay, it. Okay. That directed it. Tropic Thunder. Uh, ben uh, Stiller. Ben Stiller. Oh, One point to Dom. It. Right. Damn you, Dom. Number two. A Bronx Tale. Um, uh, Robert De Niro Robert De Niro another point to Giles come on Phil okay we're going to get my brain's bit... too slow for this <laughs> we're going to get a little bit harder here four weeks away from filming okay uh, um, this this. okay uh, Pitch Perfect 2 oh, oh that um, was um, 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 Channing Tatum no <laughs> it was the actress the actress uh, yes um, uh, uh, oh her name's gone from her head blonde uh, uh, who also did Cocaine <laughs> Bear uh, yes. Um, yes. Elizabeth um, Banks. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Banks. Banks. Oh, Phil no, got yes. in there just in time. All right. So next one. These are oh. going to get harder now. Right. This this person directed a, a film called American Pastoral and a section of a film called Tube Tales, which was a portmanteau mm. film. That's what I'm looking for. But American Pastoral. <sighs> Famous actor. I think. No, we didn't mention them. Did, Jim, 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 Jim Caviezel. They're British. Oh, oh. I'll, I'll, the actor I'll, in this. Yes, I'll keep giving clues to until you get it. Mm. They they've been heavily involved in a franchise that we have already discussed on this podcast. Uh, they've done indie and studio films like the pro- Andy Circus. Nope, good guesses though. But uh, the because Andy Circus is a director, but not on not on this list actually. But um, no bonus points for that. So f- <laughs> famous British actor done lots of indie, done lots of studio, including the biggest like some of the biggest movies out there. I think he was in a Michael Bay movie with Scarlett Johansson. Uh, he was also in Star Wars movies. Uh, he's also done indie, like uh, Star Wars <laughs> film. movies. Yeah, he was is. in three of them. I think. Ewan McGregor. It is Ewan McGregor. Well done, oh, so, Ewan, Ewan McGregor. McGregor. Yeah, yeah. Of course all right. It was. I didn't know he directed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Really? All right. So here's here's an actor who bizarrely has gone on to do, have a sort of slightly different career now, but is a famous actor you've heard of, and they've directed at least four movies called Final Portrait, Blind Date, Joel Gould's Secret. Oh, five films. The Imposters and Big Night. And then now, oh. I can see if you're going to get it just from that. If not, I'll keep giving clues. They now have books out, cookbooks, and a TV series that are around cooking. Oh, uh, is it? Is it the... Um, I don't know the name. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Okay. Hopefully, uh, the nope. collective audience is not screaming at the uh, radio right now. All right, I'm afraid. This, radio. I'm afraid. <laughs> where, where did radio come from? I'm afraid Why no is? one's. Go- no, actually, you know what? If you guys don't get it, I'm claiming the point. So I'm saying Stanley Tucci. Hooray! Stanley, oh, Stanley Tucci. Oh, that doesn't count. You uh, can't okay. win with your own points. Yeah. Well, someone, <laughs> yeah. someone's got someone to. Someone has to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Ooh. technically, that means this is the last one. This is question five. So, the scores at the moment. Um, I've got four. Dom's got three and Phil's got two. <laughs> <laughs> game ruined it. Game ruined it. So, okay. This so is the last question. For the last question. So, uh, this is a famous actor. Definitely heard of them. They've done indie and uh, I think they've been in studio Just films. Just narrow it but... down, Stephen. Move on. Ben Affleck. The, Sean film Connery. That, the film they directed is called The Dancer <laughs> Upstairs. And it was uh, from 2002. Not Bjork. No, <laughs> Javier Bardem is in it. I think um, Javier Bardem. You mean? Oh, Bardem. Sorry, yes. Because Bardem is the goalkeeper that was French goalkeeper. <laughs> oh, um, from yeah, no. <laughs> Javier Bardem. Uh, in this person is not only an actor; has been in a movie about them being an actor. Being John Malkovich. John Malkovich. Yes. Oh. No. <laughs> Dom gets Dom. the points. So that leaves final scores at this round. Me and Dom are equal the on four. Scores. Yes, we do. Oh well. It's a tough beat yep. for all three of you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm not going to even say who won the quiz because I just don't think it matters. Um, <laughs> I think I won. Managed yeah, to I Stephen. <laughs> um, so look, there we go. That's our take on what's happening on the 
strike at the moment the sex right and the writer's strike if you have any questions do email us in the filmmakers podcast at gmail.com and we'll try and answer them on the next business of film and it could be about anything any topic you like and we'll do our best to answer it so what have we learned uh, so little <laughs> so little <laughs> So we've learned that at the moment this strike could go on for a long time. We don't know when it will end. We know that quizzes aren't fair. <laughs> <laughs> Neither is Hollywood. That's what we've learned. Nothing's fair. And you have to fight for every last inch. No yeah. one gives you anything. Oh. <laughs> you can shoot in the UK at the moment, yeah. should you wish. Um, but just check everything yeah. out beforehand. Uh, and hey, try and get Mark Ruffalo in your film. He did say he would. Yeah. I feel like Mark Ruffalo is probably <laughs> regretting it. <laughs> Mark Ruffalo's agent is probably like crying. The right agent now. was like, Mark, seriously, Mark, mate. Seriously. Not, never again. Filmmakers. Yeah. I'm getting so many yeah. cheap offers. Honestly, people are yeah, offering yeah. us a kick hat to be <laughs> in a movie. <laughs> Ten bucks for Ruffalo. Yeah. Huge. So, so much of the industry is uncertain in the normal times that when we have mm. a strike that's uncertain, that causes uncertainty elsewhere, it's quite yeah, unnerving. It out. Mm. Uh, yeah, out? sadly <laughs> not. I think it squares it. it but this, yeah. it's worth recognizing. And that's also mm. what the actors are striking about is that their income is uncertain. So if the best payday isn't good, mm. then all of the other days. So yeah. it's, I think we're all, we're all feeling wherever we are in the industry, in front or behind the camera, whether we're on strike or supporting other people who are, it's just that everything is very uncertain and especially so at the moment. And that's part of the nature of the game that we're in. And that's mm. worth acknowledging because we all have our own versions of it. And I, my, my thoughts very much with you, Phil, at the moment, four weeks out, that's tough anyway because indie production is always hard and then you've got other extra uncertainties so yeah thoughts are with us <laughs> for our thoughts are with you in like having to work incredibly hard under even more uncertain than normal conditions yeah i mean look i mean i, I just feel very very if anything just feel very very lucky to be you know directing a <laughs> directing a film mm. at any you know way shape or form but especially in these uncertain times so um you know, I don't want to jinx it by saying any more, but uh, but yeah, I'm just getting my head down and doing the work until someone tells me to go home. <laughs> go home, Phil. Yeah. Go home, Phil. Oh, no, really we're, we're thinking of <laughs> you, anyway. Phil. Yeah, yeah keep, keep up the fight. It's hard to do it when you're doing it now, but like, yeah. we're all with you. Yeah. We are. Thank you guys. Much. And by the way, Giles, mm. well done on 350. That's yeah, well insane. Done, Can no, I just honestly, say, I know well, you didn't do it alone, but that's such credit. an effort. <laughs> well, no, I, well Dom, and yeah, also, right. yeah, I, know, I, know, I, I was I was going to bring you two up. It's especially impressive you've done it with these two dragging you down. No, 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 no. Well, no we, well we, haven't you, in, we haven't been in it the whole time. You, you and the whole team, jobs. but it like that is epic. I just wanted to add that. That is so impressive, and the and the duty, the service you've done to the industry and to the community is huge. So I just I'm on their behalf saying thank you and well done. I stand in solidarity with Stephen on that. That's, yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, 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 very well done. Pleasure. Well done. And I hope you out there listening uh, do get something from this every week. And look, listen, go on our socials. Someone has to. Uh, go on Twitter, go on our, our Instagram, at Filmmakers Pod, and say thank you for 350 episodes, not just to me, but to everyone who's been on and all those people who've given the time and effort to make this show. And go on iTunes and give us a five-star review. Go on. For our 350th episode, go on there if you haven't done it already and give us a lovely glowing review. <sighs> 350. Amazing. Mm, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Phil. Good luck with your film. Good luck, Thank you, man. Cheers, really guys. Good, good luck, Dom. I can't wait to hear more about it. Dom, you're a star as always. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, guys. You can go out there and do anything you can to move forward and make your film right now, and whatever that is, if you're lucky enough to rise up and do well, as Phil has done, as Stephen has done, as Dom has done, it is your duty to... Strike the elevator back down. <laughs> Until next Tuesday. Take care, everyone. We will see you in probably a month for the next business of film, though knowing us, it will probably be two. But until then, <laughs> get Mark Ruffalo in your film. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.